www.ukraine.org. Take you live now uh, to a House hearing on the Trump administration's response to the refugee crisis in Syria. This is the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Members will be hearing testimony from the State Department's special representative for Syria. California Congressman, uh, actually it is uh, Ileana ross Leighton in the chairman's seat. You're watching live coverage here on C-SPAN 3. Whoever might come for opening statements, I would love to recognize uh, all the other members uh, uh, for their opening statements, if you can keep them brief. And we will then hear from our witnesses. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Without objection, your uh, prepared statements will be made a part of the record, and all of the members may have five days to insert statements and questions for the record, subject to the length limitations in the rules. The chair now recognizes herself for five minutes. This hearing is part two of a Syria hearing that we began in September, and while it took a bit longer than we had hoped, we were very pleased to have two of the administration officials most intimately involved with U.S. Syria policy here today. Thank you, both of you. Two weeks ago, Ambassador Jeffrey laid out the administration's latest plan and objectives for Syria. First, the enduring defeat of ISIS. Second, de-escalation of the conflict and removal of the Iranian forces. Third, a political process under UN Security Council Resolution 2254. I'm glad to have Ambassador Jeffrey in his new position as Special Representative for Syria Engagement and for his more active approach. Uh, this hearing is an opportunity for the administration to explain how it plans to achieve those goals. With at least half a million killed, millions more displaced, and the security of the United States and our allies on the line, the administration owes it to the American people to put forth a comprehensive, effective, and most importantly, achievable strategy in Syria. After more than seven years of conflict, I am deeply appreciative of our men and women, both in and out of uniform, who have contributed so much of their time, of their energy, and in too many cases, their lives in an effort against ISIS and for the Syrian people. Likewise, too many good Syrians have been taken from, from us, many of whom were simply families trying to escape the brutality of both ISIS and the Assad regime, and many of whom, like the pro-democracy leader, Raed Ferris, who refused, despite threats on, after threat, to give in to the murderers and terrorists who took over his country. Um, Raed, unfortunately, was assassinated, and regime forces uh, continue to prepare an offensive in Idlib, the de demilitarized zone hanging on by a thread and chemical weapons are being used once again just this past weekend. It is more important than ever that we take a, a more active approach like Ambassador Jeffrey advocates, and we thank him for that, to not only prevent another humanitarian disaster and more loss of life, but finally to address the root cause of this conflict, and that is Assad and his cronies. Uh, I am concerned that we aren't prioritizing stabilization assistance in areas liberated from ISIS, as well as those targeted by Assad. This does not mean reconstruction assistance, but it does mean the kind of basic services and stabilization needs that would allow local communities to be more independent and to be more resilient and less susceptible to pro-Assad forces. As uh, Hanin Gadar testified, at part one of our hearings, Iran and Assad are ethnically and religiously cleansing Sunni communities to create demographic facts on the ground. And if we don't start to help Syrian communities resist those forces, we are having more areas of Syria ripe for Iran and Assad's influence on one side of the spectrum and a resurgent ISIS on the other. As we've learned the hard way in Iraq and Afghanistan over the past 17 years, it is not enough to take out the bad guys and hope for the best. We must, with our partners, create the conditions to ensure the bad guys don't come back. I am sympathetic to the challenges of delivering aid in Syria, especially when it gets diverted to the very people we're trying to defeat. In 2016, the ranking member, Mr. Deutsch, and I held a hearing with the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, and USAID's Office of Inspector General, the OIG, on a GAO report, sorry, that Ted 
uh, Jerry Connolly and I had commissioned, which found weaknesses in our humanitarian aid programs in Syria. GAO had found that most of our implementing partners were not assessing the risk of fraud and recommended that USAID and state strengthen their own fraud oversight programs as well as those of our partners. At the same time, OIG announced that it had opened 25 investigations of fraud allegations. USAID and state have made some improvement in the years since, but we continue to hear about diversion of U.S. assistance in Syria, most notably a recent incident in which, according to the OIG, one NGO's employees knowingly diverted U.S. aid-funded food kits to Syria's Al-Qaeda affiliate. I'll say that again because it's really mind-blowing. One NGO reported that uh, they had seen um, knowingly diverted U.S. aid-funded food kits being given to Syria's al-Qaeda affiliates, yikes. While USAID correctly suspended this program and others, and I am, as I said, very sympathetic to the difficulty of the mission, nobody's saying that it's easy. We cannot allow ourselves to be deterred. It is incumbent upon the administration to put the most rigorous and effective monitoring and evaluation system in place, and then ensure that those programs continue. We can't afford to be cutting stabilization assistance, never mind humanitarian aid, when every other player from Assad to Russia to Iran to Turkey to China is deeply involved and working to shape a new Syria that will undermine U.S. security interests. So I look forward to hearing from both of you gentlemen about how the administration plans to protect U.S. interests in Syria and exactly how each of our programs, goals, and objectives fit into what I hope will be a strategy for the long term and a strategy for success. I will now turn to Mr. Kinzinger for opening statements. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and again, thank you both for being here. Uh, sound like a broken record on these. Sadly, this has been going on for eight years with a lot of uh, deaths, including 50,000 children uh, in Syria, which is uh, just absolutely abhorrent. I do want to start with some, some good news, though, which is I think this administration deserves a lot of credit for a very improved Syria policy. Uh, we, we spoke a good game in the last administration, but I feel like all too often there was inaction, the most notably the red line in Syria, uh, when I think was the perfect opportunity to basically get rid of the Syrian regime. Uh, and do it in a way that would have ended far better than what we see today in, in Syria. But that said, I think the administration has made it clear uh, that there is American and humanitarian interests in Syria that will defend. Uh, we don't want to see Iran with a post uh, whatever goes on presence in Syria. We've been clear about the need to stop the land bridge to Israel uh, and all those other things. I do want to echo the chairwoman's concern about aid, though, as well. Um, I think we need to really take a good, solid look at how we're distributing aid. Uh, I think the UN does us a disservice in some of that uh, in terms of legitimizing the regime. I think there's areas maybe we can do aid directly, especially areas and communities near U.S. military troops as they starve and they look 100 feet away and see well-fed American troops and the opposition uses that, the evil folks use that as a uh, propaganda win. So I thank you again both for being here, your great service, and Madam Chair, I thank you for your fantastic service. It's been a pleasure serving with you and uh, I'll yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Kinzinger. You can have more time if you'd like. And I'm so pleased to yield time to uh, Ambassador Wagner for uh, her opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, for organizing this hearing. And, and I'd like to echo um, uh, the accolades of the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kinziger, in, uh, in saying that your leadership, not just on this committee, but in Congress for so many years, uh, will be sorely missed. And uh, we are grateful for that service. Before we begin today, I'd like to honor the memory of uh, Rayed uh, uh, Fares, uh, a courageous Syrian activist who was assassinated just last Friday. When war broke out seven years ago, Mr. Fares um, founded a radio station to give the opposition a voice, a voice and highlight the suffering that uh, Assad had inflicted upon his own people. I want to share what Mr. Fares said after surviving an assassination attempt back in 2014, and I quote, when we started our revolution, we broke the barrier of fear. 
We're not afraid. We just want to reach our aims, dignity and freedom, and we will get them. So I offer my sincerest condolences to Mr. Farz's family and to the people of Syria who have lost one of their bravest voices. Um, I thank our witnesses for their time and their service. I look forward to hearing more about the work the U.S. is doing to advance dignity and freedom in Syria. I thank you, Madam Chair. Beautiful statement. Thank you so much. He certainly was a remarkable human being. We were honored to have met him. And we want to thank Mr. LaHood. I know he doesn't have an opening statement, but he's not a member of our subcommittee, but he's very involved in these issues. So we welcome you, Mr. LaHood. And now I'd like to introduce our, our two incredible uh, witnesses for today's hearing. We're delighted to welcome back Ambassador James Jeffrey, the State Department's Special Representative for Syria Engagement. We were grateful for his insight in, at our hearings in his previous role, and I'm very glad to see him in this new position. There could be no one better than you, Mr. Ambassador. In 2010, Ambassador Jeffrey was appointed to the highest rank in the U.S. Foreign Service career ambassador and has served as the United States Ambassador to Iraq, to Turkey, and Albania, as well as the Deputy National Security Advisor and a U.S. Army Infantry Officer in Germany and Vietnam. Thank you for your service. We look forward to your testimony, sir. And secondly, we'd, um, we're delighted to welcome Mr. Robert Jenkins, who serves as Deputy Assistant Administrator for a, a terrific agency, USAID, and he works in the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance. Previously, Mr. Jenkins served as the Director of USAID's Office of Transition Initiatives, as well as its Deputy Director and Operations Coordinator. Prior to joining USAID, Mr. Jenkins designed emergency relief programs with World Vision International, a terrific organization, and was a Thomas J. Watson Fellow. Thank you for your service. We also look forward to hearing your testimony. And as I said, gentlemen, your complete statements have been made a part of the record. Feel free to uh, summarize, and then we will ask you some questions. Thank you. Ambassador, you're recognized. Uh, thank you mu very much, uh, Madam uh, Chairwoman. It is very good to be back here with you, and thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, it's been an honor to be uh, working with you over the years. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, you and the other members of this uh, committee have summarized very well the seven years of horror uh, brought about by the Assad regime, uh, enabled by Russia and Iran's malign influence, not just, but particularly in Syria, uh, and what it has brought us to in this uh, horrific situation. Uh, this administration is committed to a way forward. Again, uh, Madam Chairman, you laid it out. I'll repeat it uh, for the record. <clears throat> we are here to, first of all, ensure the uh, enduring defeat of ISIS uh, in Syria, particularly in the area where we are, but throughout the whole country, that's important. Uh, and that's the mission that we have given to the U.S. military there. Secondly, uh, the United States, with all of our elements of power, uh, are, is committed to the uh, withdrawal of all Iranian commanded forces from the entirety of Syria and an irreversible political process that will change the nature of, in the behavior of the Syrian government, because without such a change, we are not going to see an end to this conflict. This is not regime change per se. It's not related to personalities. It's related to the policies of that regime. Uh, as <clears throat> Secretary Pompeo uh, stated on October 10th, these three goals are mutually supported, and I would like to spend a few minutes talking about how we're going to try to weave these goals together to answer the question that you and others have raised of what is our policy going forward. Um, first of all, you cannot ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. That's what we experienced, including me personally in Iraq in 2010 to 2012, of any terrorist organization if you don't deal with the root causes of it. Well, the root causes of ISIS, mainly in Syria, but to some degree in Iraq, have been, first of all, the horrific behavior of the Assad regime against its own people, giving those people no other chance but to turn to whomever would take up arms against Assad, and that was unfortunately including terrorists. Uh, secondly, it is the role of Iran spreading its tentacles around the Arabic 
Sunni world. This is an outside uh, force that creates uh, malignant antibodies if we, that is the international community, do not respond in a proper way. We did not respond in a proper way to advance Iran's encroachment into these areas, so the peoples of the area in desperation uh, fell victim to uh, the false claims, the false promises of ISIS and other terrorist organizations. So we do have to do all three. We cannot just rely upon the military defeat of the caliphate right now along the Mesopotamia, the uh, uh, Euphrates, uh, along the uh, Iraqi border. We have to go after the root causes, and our policy is aimed at that. Uh, in terms of the uh, way forward to execute these other two more political goals, of uh, an irreversible political process and uh, the removal of Iran, what we're looking at, as President Trump laid out in the UN General Assembly back in September, is a de-escalation of the conflict and uh, a reinvigoration of the political process. Let me talk first about the de-escalation of the conflict. Uh, we now have other than the fighting against ISIS, a near ceasefire, informal and shaky throughout the country with us in the uh, Northeast, uh, with our uh, partner forces, the SDF, and in Al Tamf in the South, again with partner forces, the MAT, uh, the Turks in the Northwest. Uh, that's about 40% of the country. Almost half of the population is not under Assad's control. They're either in those areas or they're across the border. Uh, and we're going to work with the UN, work with the Russians, uh, work with the international community to, to the extent we can, solidify these ceasefires. That's called for in the relevant UN resolution 2254, and then try to use that to leverage the political process. The political process has not done well, including today, the last effort to try to form a constitutional committee of opposition, government, and neutral representatives failed in a meeting held by uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkey uh, in Astana, Kazakhstan. Uh, but we are not going to give up on that uh, path forward. There has to be fundamental change in the way that this regime works with its own people to avoid the threat that the regime and the uh, uh, state make towards its own population and to our allies and friends in the region. That is, first and foremost, Israel, but also Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, Lebanon, and other states. Uh, this is a International situation, we have five countries outside uh, states with military forces right now in Syria, Iran, Russia, the United States, uh, Turkey, and uh, the Israeli Air Force. There's a real danger of uh, uh, collisions, military uh, actions between the two, as we saw with the shootdown of the uh, Russian IL-20. And so the situation is quite dangerous in terms of state-to-state -state conflict. We're working to avoid that while at the same time building on this ceasefire to set forth uh, a legitimate political process that is worthy of the name of uh, uh, the UN uh, vision for Syria being at peace with itself and at peace with its neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent uh, statement. <coughs> and Mr. Jenkins, um, We've been joined by uh, a ranking member, Mr. Deutsch, who, uh, and it shows you the high level of uh, interest he has on this uh, on this issue because we know that uh, on your side you've got a lot a lot going on and competing uh, time restraints. So thank you, Mr. Deutsch, for joining us, and I'd love to have you give your opening statement, sir. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> great. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thanks for calling the hearing. Uh, thanks, Ambassador Jeffrey, Mr. Jenkins, for uh, for appearing before the committee today. Um, uh, Mr. Jenkins, thanks for the difficult work that USAID does to address the humanitarian crisis in Syria, and we appreciate that. Ambassador Jeffrey, you're no stranger to the committee. Um, I was encouraged by your appointment as Special Representative for Syria Engagement, and I'm hopeful that you will lead the administration to finally solidifying a comprehensive strategy for Syria. The uh, Thus far, the administration's failure to, to really codify what we aim to accomplish and how we plan to accomplish it has been concerning to say the least. I'm sorry that I got here just after your comments, but I know we'll be spending a lot of time together going forward. Uh, in the past year, we've seen Iran expand its military footprint, getting closer and closer to Israel's border, 
And while I'm encouraged by the progress against ISIS, which has seen the group lose tremendous amounts of territory since mid-2015, the administration hasn't made tangible efforts to solidify a strategy to ensure that ISIS doesn't uh, resurge after conventional fighting is concluded, nor does it seem that the administration have a plan for our future relationship with the Syrian Kurds, whose partnership has resulted in the most dramatic losses for ISIS in Syria. The administration's missile strikes against the Assad regime, while something I support, lack a strategic backing to actually alter Assad's behavior, uh, and I worry appear thus just as empty gestures. Assad continues to break international law and commit human rights crimes on a massive scale. The administration has stated that it wants to find peace diplomatically through the Geneva process, which in the last several years has failed to bring the Syrian conflict to an end. The administration has also stated it wants Syria to no longer be led by the brutal Assad regime, but we haven't seen any evidence that the administration has a plan to achieve these goals. The State Department has stated the U.S. will not commit itself to full reconstruction until there is a credible and irreversible political process underway to end the crisis. However, after the regime, Iran and Russia have routinely made a mockery of international proceedings to lessen the suffering of the Syrian people, I have little confidence in such a process. The tyrannical Assad regime has played the international community for a fool by hiding behind the so-called de-escalation zones that allow him to dedicate military resources to one front before breaking the agreement to bomb civilian targets in other zones. We have sat by watching as he continues to use chemical weapons, cluster munitions, barrel bombs, starvation, and other horrendous illegal measures to break civilian enclaves and crush opposition parties. The humanitarian crisis in Syria continues to be wrought with uncertainty. In Idlib, the sporadic fighting between the pro-regime forces and opposition groups threatens an all-out assault on a region with a large number of internally displaced civilians where, with nowhere else to go. A full regime assault on Idlib threatens to cause the largest humanitarian crisis of this entire conflict. In June, I wrote to the Secretary of State asking him to prepare to mitigate such a disaster and to account for why the administration froze $200 million in stabilization funds, which included funding for Radio Fresh, an independent radio station which countered the extremist propaganda ripe in northwestern Syria. Last week, the founder of Radio Fresh, Rayad Fares, was killed, striking a blow to those of us who support counter-extremism and pro-democracy efforts in Syria. To me, and I know to many of us on this committee, cuts to programs like this further demonstrate the lack of a plan to address ISIS's long-term threat. Uh, and having had the opportunity to spend time with Rayad and to hear him speak about the number of times he was able to avoid the attacks on him, uh, the news was uh, particularly difficult for us to take. This pullback in stabilization assistance once again seeds American leadership. Though the Russians will be more than happy to try to fill that void, I know the administration will also say that Saudi Arabia is picking up the funding commitment, but the question is, can we guarantee that we will be able to use that funding to advance what we believe are the best strategic interests for our own country. Congress has questions, we've had questions, and we need adequate answers to those questions. The President has repeatedly said that we are in Syria to defeat and destroy ISIS. Now, the administration talks of American troops staying in Syria until Iran leaves. How do we plan to achieve a complete Iranian withdrawal and avoid any direct military confrontation with Iran? Do we expect Russia or Assad to ask Iran and its proxies to leave? What will happen to the stagnating peace process in the wake of envoy Staffan de Mistura stepping down? Finally, I would note that the House has taken meaningful action to help push the political process along by passing legislation, the Caesar Syrian Civilian Protection Act, authored by the ranking member, Mr. Mr. Engel, that would give the administration tools to go after those that support the Assad regime and the ability to waive sanctions if meaningful negotiations are taking place and violence has ceased. I hope that the Senate will finally pass this bill before Congress adjourns. Ambassador Jeffrey, Mr. Jenkins, I want this to be a productive hearing. Uh, I'm sorry that my colleagues uh, can't be here 
except for Mr. Schneider, whom I'm grateful has arrived. Uh, I hope today will, I know today will shed light on how going forward the administration is going to address uh, what uh, has been to date the lack of a real Syria policy. And I hope that we'll get the opportunity to continue this conversation into the new Congress. Thanks again to our witnesses for being here. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for letting me uh, present. Thank you today. very much, Mr. Deutsch. As always, you make uh, excellent points. And now we're pleased to hear from Mr. Jenkins. Thank you. Chairman Rosleitenen, <clears throat> Ranking Member Deutsch, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. As you've already heard, for more than seven years, the regime of Bashar al-Assad has raged an unrelenting campaign of terror against its own civilians including the use of chemical weapons. In 2014, the emergence of ISIS exasperated the crisis, imposing brutal tactics, including beheadings and torture. Nearly 11.3 million people are displaced within Syria or have fled to neighboring countries as refugees, nearly the entire population of southern Florida. Through it all, the United States remains committed to the Syrian people. Our assistance is reaching 5 million Syrians every month, 4 million Syrians inside across all 14 governments, and another 1 million refugees in neighboring countries. Using backpacks, small trucks, drops from airplanes, even donkeys, USAID works with partners who will do whatever it takes to get the job done. Flexibility is key to our response. USAID food assistance includes both foodstuffs such as wheat and rice, but it also includes ready-to-eat rations for people on the move. Our assistance to refugees also includes vouchers so that they can buy food in local markets. Since the conflict started, nearly 75% of Syria's medical doctors have left the country, leaving a profound health care gap. At great risk to their own safety, USAID partners have stepped in to fill the void. Last year alone, our partners responded to the health needs of almost 5 million people inside Syria. Their heroic efforts and courage have saved countless lives. As ISIS has been driven out of areas of northeast Syria, people have started returning home. In Raqqa, 80% of the buildings are either entirely destroyed or very seriously damaged, and half of the city's water infrastructure is in need of rehabilitation. Here, the U.S. is providing safe drinking water and food, distributing shelter and other relief supplies, and providing health care services. I saw the impact of our assistance firsthand in January, when I was able to travel to Raqqa with our administrator, Mike, uh, our administrator Mark Green, and U.S. CENTCOM Commander Joseph Votel. It was chilling to drive around Naim's Circle, which became the focal point of the Syrian Democratic Forces' victory celebrations after Raqqa was liberated. Just three months prior, the spikes on the fence around the fountain where people were celebrating had been used to display the heads of ISIS victims. To sit there, stand there, look at that, was chilling. Despite our best efforts, the single greatest factor limiting the reach of our humanitarian assistance is access. The Syrian regime has now regained control of the Southwest. After that, they cut off the cross-border humanitarian operations from Jordan, a major blow to our response efforts. Similarly, aid groups struggle to reach people living in territory controlled by terrorist organizations. Despite our best efforts, there have been failures which we have sought to learn from. USAID has put risk mitigation programs in place to reduce the possibility of fraud, waste, abuse, and the diversion of assistance. We place the highest priority on ensuring that taxpayer funds are used wisely, effectively, and for their intended purpose. Humanitarian assistance alone cannot provide a solution to the conflict, but it is saving lives and helping to alleviate the suffering of everyday people throughout the region. The United States remains committed to a strong humanitarian response to support the Syrian people and Syria's neighbors. Thank you for your time, and in particular, 
Madam Chairman, I'd like to thank you on behalf of USAID for your service and your commitment to foreign assistance. Thank you. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you so much. And, and I was very moved by um, your voice when you were speaking. And I can see how this impacts the folks who are trying to make things better, as well as, of course, the people of Syria themselves. But thank you. I can see that you're a devoted public servant who, who feels in his heart the, the heartbreak. Uh, that is going on in that in that region. And Ambassador Jeffrey, as I said in, in my opening statement, I, I'm so very glad to have you in this uh, new position. I appreciate your more active approach in Syria. And now in your testimony, you stated that your confidence in Russia's promise was, uh, was weakened after the violation of the uh, Southwest de-escalation zone this summer, an area agreed to by President Trump and that the violation had consequences. But as far as I know, there have been no costs to Russia uh, to date, uh, despite two State Department warnings uh, telling Russia not to violate the zone. Could you explain why the State Department issued these warnings when, in the end, there were no costs when the zone wasn't enforced? And what cost against Russia is the administration prepared to make um, should Russia decide to violate another de-escalation zone? Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, the U.S. had negotiated a deconfliction agreement with Russia, as you uh, pointed out, uh, at the presidential level in Da Nang a year ago. Uh, the Russians did not adhere to their commitments under that agreement, and they not only allowed, but they supported uh, the influx of Syrian forces into the Southwest with the humanitarian, the military, and the other consequences. Uh, the administration issued initial warnings uh, of a diplomatic nature. Uh, absent military force, there was, uh, for which there was no uh, legal authorization, uh, the administration was not able to take further action directly at that point. What this led to directly was a series of decisions by the administration, first of all, uh, to continue uh, our presence in Syria against uh, ISIS, because that's what they're there for, that's what the authorization is, but to ensure that we don't turn that mission over to anybody else until it is finished particularly anybody else who is liable to uh, abuse the people in those areas, abuse our partners and everything else. So that's one decision. A second decision was to strengthen the absolute commitment we have to block any reconstruction assistance to the criminal uh, callous Assad regime until that regime starts contributing to the political process. And then thirdly, to play a much stronger role in the diplomacy uh, designed to achieve that. And I'll cite a success that we had, uh, and that is Idlib, the last of the uh, deconfliction zones, which the Turks had negotiated originally with the Iranians and the uh, uh, Russians uh, almost a year ago. Uh, in uh, the 7th of September, uh, Putin humiliated uh, President uh, Erdogan by saying there would be no ceasefire. Seven, ten days later, Erdogan uh, got a ceasefire agreement in writing from Putin in Idlib that is still holding. Uh, one reason for the change was President Trump's direct and dramatic intervention in that, not only by saying we would take very strong action if chemical weapons were used in any offensive, uh, and he made that very, very clear, and we uh, worked with our allies to ensure this wouldn't be America alone. But secondly, uh, the president uh, stated publicly that this would be uh, a reckless escalation of the conflict, and he kept a drumbeat of pressure on Russia, both publicly and privately. If I could interrupt. So you're saying that um, it basically was a, a diplomatic arrangement, that, that uh, there was no teeth to that were to be violated, which it was. There was no agreement about what penalties could be imposed, and that we no longer <laughs> trust Russia to, to keep its promise. We no longer will rely only on diplomatic measures to hold to agreements, Madam Chairman. Okay, let me, let me uh, now, even, you did not mention Hezbollah by name, but, uh, but you did refer to 
Iranian commanded forces. Can you clarify for us, do you and the administration, do you consider Hezbollah one of these Iranian commanded forces and is its removal from Syria a stated U.S. goal? It is a stated U.S. goal. When we say Iranian commanded, uh, we were thinking specifically of Hezbollah. Uh, they take pride of place of all of the awful outside forces that have contributed to chaos. Now, is there any reason why that exact word is not, that term is not used? Uh, there are so many Iranian commanded just want to make sure militias. that it's an umbrella term. It's an umbrella term. Okay. Now, I know that you share my feelings, and every, everyone thinks that uh, Assad is the root cause of the, of the conflict in Syria, and you've said elsewhere that the Assad regime produced ISIS and that the regime's behavior will lead to its reemergence. And with that in mind, will you commit, or will the administration commit to Assad not running in a future election, are you, we going to have an official position on that? We do not have an official position on any personality other than that we think Assad is exactly the worst person to rule any place. What we're trying to do, in part, Madam Chairman, to, as this committee has indicated in many uh, instances it wants us to do, to build up an international coalition. Rightly or wrongly, the bulk of the international community is not going to follow us in regime change efforts because there's a long history of them, frankly, not turning out very well. So what we're looking for is a change of behavior, a dramatic, drastic change in behavior by the Syrian government to be a very different uh, government to its own people and, as I mentioned, to its neighbors and the one we have today. We'll now, is it, is it realistic, Mr. Ambassador, to, to think that the Syrian people would want Assad to run again, and, and how could an election possibly be uh, free and fair if the Assad regime is still in place? Uh, the relevant UN resolution 2254 tasks the UN, and the UN, this is one thing it is good at, uh, for running free and fair elections, including among the diaspora and everybody that isn't under Assad's control. That's roughly half the population. We cannot imagine the bulk of that population voting for that individual if there is free election. So if you're wondering what the solution to Assad is, it's to carry out UN Resolution 2254. Thank you so much. And I have further questions for you, Mr. Jenkins, but I want to uh, yield time to uh, our ranking member, who will soon be the chairman of this committee, Mr. Deutsch. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, in a, uh, a, letter there, a letter from the State Department in September, which I'd like to enter into the record, I was told that objection. The, the president has been clear that we are prepared to remain in Syria until the enduring defeat of ISIS, and we remain focused on ensuring the withdrawal of Iranian forces and their proxies. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, how far will the administration go to remove Iranian proxies from Syria? Uh, first of all, that is a diplomatic goal. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, that is not a military goal of our military forces now, or it never has been. Uh, our military forces are present in Syria to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. We believe one element of that is to work on the diplomatic track to get foreign forces out that have entered since 2011. That would include uh, the Iranian forces because they're a particular problem both for the situation inside of the country and the security of Israel, Turkey, right. and Jordan. So, so if military force is not an option, how does the administration plan to use the diplomatic process to achieve that goal? Uh, well, first of all, to put the regime under as much economic pressure through the denial, not only by us, but by the rest of the international community, of uh, reconstruction. The regime is sitting on top of a big pile of rubble in Aleppo and much of the country. Secondly, to impose ever tougher sanctions on uh, the regime and on those people that uh, aid and abet it, and here we'll be asking and looking for help from uh, Congress in this regard. Um, what's the long-term strategy for the areas in northeastern Syria currently held by the SCF, uh, especially if, if, as we believe, the regime attempts to retake that territory? Uh, first of all, we think that any intervention by anyone into the northeast as yeah. we continue our operations uh, against uh, uh, Daesh or ISIS uh, would be of great concern, particularly uh, placing American uh, troops at risk, as you know. Uh, sir, uh, there have been several attempts to penetrate that uh, near Dar es Salaam, for example, and we have responded uh, using our inherent right of self-defense. Uh, what we are hoping to do is to uh, 
help stabilize that area and then ensure that that area becomes integrated into a new Syrian body politic. We are not trying to create a separate entity. We are not trying to change the territorial integrity of Syria. We are trying to, for the moment, stabilize that area, keep ISIS out, keep the situation peaceful, and work to use that as part of the leverage to try to uh, push the political process forward. Um, so let me go back to Iran and its proxies for a second. What, um, what, what role does Russia play? What, what are the, uh, you talked about sanctions, we're going to impose sanctions and we're going to ratchet up the pressure. I understand that. Um, what role does Russia play in this? What, uh, what discussions have we had? What discussions are ongoing? To what extent will they be helpful uh, in helping to push Iran out? Or will they hinder our ability, despite our efforts to ratchet up the pressure, to push Iran out? Um, we talk to the Russians at almost every level. Uh, including uh, the president uh, spoke at length with uh, President Putin at the Helsinki uh, summit about uh, Syria. And we have at various levels, some of them confidential, some of them more open, such as at the UN General Assembly and the Security Council, uh, we have exchanges uh, very, very frequently uh, with our Russian interlocutors. In addition to the deconfliction conversations our military has with the Russians as well, which is important. So there's a very rich exchange of at least positions. Uh, we have made it clear to the Russians that there is no solution to this conflict as long as Iranian forces are there. What do we use as uh, leverage? We point out that all foreign forces who have entered since 2011, that would not include the Russians who have been there for decades, uh, need to lead the country sooner or later as part of a uh, uh, solution uh, negotiated by the UN and supported by the international community. That is a benefit uh, to everybody involved. Uh, and uh, absent that, we're going to sit in the situation we are right now. For right. Well, Ambassador Jeffrey, that would include the Russians. And I, I appreciate the rich exchange of ideas. Those are our ideas. What ideas do we hear back from the Russians? The Russians, first of all, want to secure their own interests there, which begin with bases. Secondly, they want a friendly government. What they have not yet done, and you're absolutely right, is define to us how they can achieve their goals while also meeting our goals, which we've made very clear to them. This is still an ongoing uh, process, and we haven't reached that point yet. Well, I'm glad that you're now part of this process, Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, uh, Madam Chairman, before I yield back, I know that it is your desire, and I hope that we are able to have uh, one more mm -hmm. hearing before we finish. But in the event that the uh, the time timing does not permit that, um, I will use this opportunity to just quickly say quickly that um, for those of us who, uh, not just those of us who serve on the committee, but for those of us who uh, who pay attention to foreign affairs. Uh, I think it is clear that if you are a dictator or a despot or a brutal regime anywhere in the world that violates human rights and supports terror, um, that for these past decades now, uh, and certainly for the time that, um, uh, that my chair has been sitting as chairman of this committee and chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, they understand that there is no one more committed to standing up for American values and American principles uh, uh, as the chairman. And um, a lot of people, I will just, I could go on and on, there will be opportunities for that, and I'll look forward to embarrassing you in those opportunities. I will just simply say that for, uh, for those who look at the United States House and, uh, and our uh, fond of pointing out the inability of, of members of Congress to work across the aisle uh, to accomplish things on behalf of the American people. Um, there is no important work that we do here than uh, standing up for the values that we hold dear, and there is no one on um, either side of the aisle who best represents that and stands as the model of working with anyone and everyone who is willing to fight for those basic human rights and American values than our chairman. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you so me. much. You're a mensch. Thank you so much, Ted. He's my friend. Thank you. And we don't need to continue with that. <laughs> Mr. Kinzinger is recognized, and you already said it. Well, thank no, I, actually, I'm going to say do that I think it's important to note that sometimes you tick us off pretty bad, too. 
Um, you know, there's days when we're kind of miserable and I'm in a bad mood around here, and it always really makes me upset to see you smile no matter what. <laughs> and it's like, you just be in a bad mood once, and, uh, but you never are, so thank you for that. Um, as I mentioned earlier in my opening statement, uh, this administration, uh, and frankly the prior administration, inherited a really bad situation uh, in Syria, of which there's no easy answers. Um, I do think uh, that one of the solutions we need to do is to frankly target Assad. I think target his military. I think that can compel Assad and Russia to the table to a solution. I understand that may not be on the table. I'm not sure the internal discussions but I think that would actually be the fastest way to compel the Russians and the Iranians and the Syrians to the table. Uh, let me just ask you really quickly, Mr. Ambassador, does, has the administration taken a position on the uh, Caesar Act, the Caesar Civilian Protection Act? I do not believe we have taken a specific uh, position on uh, that particular piece of legislation. You know it's complicated for us to do that on a particular piece of legislation. More generally, we believe that the more sanctions we can impose on uh, that regime, particularly in key strategic areas that uh, serve their military, that serve the regime directly, uh, all the better for our entire policy. And if this House can help in one way or the other without endorsing specific legislation, uh, that's our position. Well, I'd like to ping pong that back to you. We've, we've passed the Syrian Act, Civilian Protection Act here. It is in the Senate. As I know, it's been hotlined, but there is uh, at least one senator with a more exotic view on foreign policy than most people have. <laughs> That's trying to slow that up, and I think the administration uh, is probably the last hope to get that through. So you don't have to comment on that, but I think it's something worth noting because uh, we have a very limited time, and that would be our best shot. Uh, given that there's been a lot of attention uh, with Saudi Arabia and their actions with the uh, journalist, which I think the actions were abhorrent, um, but just this week we learned the fate of uh, Layla, uh, a Chicago-born aid worker helping displaced persons in eastern Gouda. Uh, Layla disappeared over two years ago where she was detained and tortured for eight months before being transferred to a military court. This week our worst fears were confirmed. She was tortured and executed by Assad's forces on December 28th, just after Christmas 2016. We know that Bashar al-Assad and his Russian and Iranian backers have committed countless war crimes like those endured by Layla. And yet we haven't acted on that, and that's where I want to begin. With the news of Layla's death, uh, she became the first American citizen that we know of to be killed by the Assad regime. And this is an incredibly point, uh, important point to note. Whatever response the administration decides to take will shape how the regime and its backers treat other Americans in their custody now or potentially in their custody in the future. Mr. Ambassador, how does the administration plan to respond to the killing of an American in Syrian soil? Uh we can confirm that uh, uh, she was, uh, she is deceased and that this was in Syrian government uh, hands. We're looking into that. Uh, this is something that, just like you, we take very, very seriously. If I can change uh, my testimony from a moment ago, we do support uh, the Caesar Act. Great. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying the administration's support of that. That's, I think, very important. Thank you. Um, do you know the uh, status of any other Americans currently being held in Assad's torture and detention facilities? Uh, there is various uh, inquiries underway. Uh, there are reports. Uh, none of these I can talk about in an open session. Understood. Uh, uh, we all know that there is four broad instruments of power the United States can use diplomatic information, military, and economic. I think we've used a number of those well. One is uh, that I think is important to note is information. Earlier this year, the administration decided to withdraw all assistance from northwest Syria, and some of those funds have been reinstated, which we appreciate, but others have been ignored. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, Radio Fresh, which I actually did an interview on a number of years ago, was run by a man that I had a pleasure to meet, Mr. Ferris. Uh, the programming was centered around anti-extremism messaging and reached two million of the most at-risk individuals for radicalization. Unlike northeast Syria, where we have a military presence, U.S. stabilization aid as our only leverage to push back against radicalism in the Northwest. And last Friday, he was assassinated by the same terrorist groups he dedicated his life to speaking out against. He was a U.S. partner in one of our most effective bulwarks against the rise of al-Qaeda in Syria. Uh, how do you think, uh, Mr. Ambassador, the United States can learn from his assassination so that critical programs in Idlib can get renewed U.S. funding? Uh, 
Mr. Congressman, this is one of my top priorities, is to review uh, not just that particular program, uh, Radio Fresh, but also uh, the aid to the uh, White Helmets, which we're able to restore temporarily in several other programs. Uh, you know the backstory, I'm sure, when we suddenly lost all American assistance to the Northeast, where we have troops in contact, uh, we shifted whatever money we could uh, into that area. We're now looking at the consequences of that, particularly with the situation around Idlib, which is of strategic concern to us, uh, just as much as the Northeast. And uh, we'll have to get back to you on it, but it is something we take very, very seriously. And, and I believe you do, and thank you. And nobody wants to waste money, but we want to spend it effectively. Uh, my time's up, and Mr. Jenkins, well, I don't have a question for you, uh, and I apologize for that. I want to say thank you for your hard work, too, and everybody that works for you. I think in many times uh, the work that you and your folks do gets overlooked, but it's extremely important. So thank you, and please pass that on. For both of you, thank you for being here. Amen. That's true. Thank you, Mr. Connell. <coughs> thank you. Thank Madam. you for the little chocolates. Absolutely. Um, and uh, thank you for all of your service and your friendship. We will miss you um, a great deal. Um, <clears throat> Ambassador Jeffrey, um, my understanding is there's somewhere between 25,000 and 100,000 Iranian-supported troops, including Hezbollah, in Syria. Is that, I mean, that's pretty wide range, but is that estimate close? Uh, you're almost certainly somewhere in there. Yeah. Well, um, but still, that's a lot of people. And our goal is complete removal of Iranian and Iranian-backed troops in Syria. Is that correct? That is correct. How do we, let's take the upper end for a second. Let's just theorize that it's 100,000, closer to that than 25,000. How in the world do we propose, given our limited footprint in Syria, and our, frankly our limited influence historically in Syria, how do we propose to remove, remove 100,000 very determined troops in foreign soil uh, that's not friendly to the United States? Uh, boy, is that ever a good question. Uh, we don't plan on doing it through military force. By the way, Madam Chairman, you heard that was a good question, and you know why? Why? Because I worked for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I, you know, had heard that. Just thought I'd mention it. I don't it know that many members know it. Brand but I is, Madam Chairman. Yeah, that's right. What will we do if you don't, not here to remind <laughs> Thank us? Thank you. We need to I'm hear sorry, that at that's least a in inside every joke. No, that, that's fine. The more discussion, the less time I have. <laughs> very good question. Give us your magic solution. Um, basically, this has to be done through diplomatic effort. I can see the rolling of eyes, but I was personally involved in the rollback of 25,000 Russian troops from Georgia in 2008. Uh, we saw the withdrawal of the Israeli army from the Sinai after 1973. It is perfectly conceivable and quite normal in international relations for peace processes to lead to settlements that lead to withdrawals of foreign forces from somebody else's territory. So if I understand your answer, it's not that we have some detailed plan to do it. Our answer is within the context of some kind of overall peace settlement, exactly. that, would be a, that would be a provision. That would be an absolute requirement. Uh, and, but we sweeten it by saying our troops will eventually leave. Uh, the Turkish uh, president, uh, Tayyip Erdogan, has said when there's a political process in elections under 2254, the UN resolution, uh, his troops are ready to leave. The Israelis tell us that they only carry out military operations because the Iranians are there. So you can see the elements of a uh, uh, possible solution. Um, the Turks previously had a goal of the removal of Assad, kind of a scene going on for them. Mm -hmm. Has that changed, or is that still their goal? Um, I have a tough enough time sometimes answering questions on U.S. foreign policy. Turkey, even though I spent nine years there, is even more difficult. But I uh, do not believe that that is the official policy of the Turkish government. What I can assure you is the Turkish government sees uh, existential dangers coming from multiple sources within Syria, and one of them is certainly uh, the current Syrian government. Um, I believe it had been a cardinal part of their policy vis-a-vis -vis Syria. In fact, it was a bit of a bone of contention between us and, and Turkey. But mm -hmm. all right, 
Well, you said multiple concerns. One of those concerns is the role of the Kurds, mm -hmm. our allies, militarily, uh, in trying to win back territory in Syria from uh, uh, folks who were uh, certainly uh, hostile to our and Western values and interests. Um, how do we reconcile our relationship with Kurds who have fought and won uh, on Syrian territory uh, with the, the Turks' concern, mm -hmm. and, I mean, active concern, because they put troops into Syria not to overthrow uh, Assad as much as to counter the Kurdish influence, our ally. Mm -hmm. How do we reconcile that difference? Yeah, the, the Turks have actually used troops against the regime. They've used it against ISIS, and they've used it against the Kurds in Afrin. Uh, but um, first of all, it's... Uh, yeah, I w I, excuse me. I wasn't denying that. Yeah. I was pointing out right. they actually introduced troops no, right. for this specific purpose. I didn't mean to say yeah. there weren't other purposes, but no. that's how serious they take no. it. The Turks are very concerned about this. We understand this because there are uh, various ties between uh, some of the Kurdish organizations that we deal with, specifically the uh, PYD, YPG, uh, which is an element of the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is the... Um, military partner that we're working with against ISIS. Uh, and we understand and have daily exchanges with the Turks on this. Uh, most uh, importantly, we have a major uh, activity with the Turks going on in the Mambich region to the west of the Euphrates, uh, where we're working to encourage the PYD and the YPG to leave that area. And that's proceeding, I think, all in all quite well with the Turks. We have other concerns with them. But again, our relationship with uh, not just the specific Kurdish party, but other parties are tactical in, uh, uh, trans not transformational, but tactical and uh, temporary in order to uh, secure a goal that we both share, which is, the and many others do, which is the defeat of ISIS. Uh, we are not picking winners and losers in terms of any political movements inside Syria. Uh, the way we'll try to help all Syrians, whether they're in the Northeast or elsewhere, is to find a political process that allows uh, a better government, uh, democratic elections, and peace that everybody can profit from. Uh, it's just like we work with groups such as the Kurdish KDP and the uh, uh, Shia Arab uh, Islamic Revolution before 2003, uh, in Iraq, but when we went into Iraq, we didn't support that political party or this political party. We just tried to work with all Iraqis to help provide a constitutional democratic system, and this is what we'll work in the international community to do for all Syrians. Well, uh, thank you. My time is up. I would just say w one must be very careful about preserving the integrity and good name of the United States. It's one thing to decide that we're not taking political sides. It's another to abandon an ally mm -hmm. that put blood on the table when they were the only ones willing to do it. Um, and, and the Kurds fought and won territory. And it's, it, it's a fine line between saying, well, once we get to peace, you know, you, you're a party at the table, but you're not the only party uh, or a favored party. And it's quite another to make them I mean, to actually abandon them because of outside pressure from another country with a different agenda. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Connolly. Thank you so much. Now we're pleased to hear from Ambassador Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Jenkins, um, as you noted, conflict situations put women and girls at a much higher risk of, of uh, violence and exploitation. I appreciate the the ways in which USAID is working to protect this vulnerable population. What challenges has USAID come across in its work to prevent gender-based violence, and how can Congress help you overcome these issues? Thank you very much for your question. And yes, sadly, it is a fact of modern warfare that the victims that are hurt the most are women and children. And the crisis that we're looking at and talking about right now in Syria, many could say it is a protection crisis mm -hmm. for all of the vulnerable people, IDPs multiple times over. The number of widows and orphans is astounding in that population. And we are very dedicated to making sure that every one of our humanitarian assistance programs integrates protection <laughs> for women and children into those, that program 
but also last year we spent about almost $28 million on programming specifically to protect women and children. That looks like um, sometimes it's as simple as creating safe spaces for women and girls to be alone and away from, from other parts of the community. It involves training healthcare workers, training educators, training teachers for the, what, what to look out for, for mm -hmm. people that might be victims of sexually based violence. It's working with healthcare workers on how do you treat someone who's been a victim of specially, uh, sexually based violence and actually the provision of different equipment and, mat and, and materials for that. One of the challenges that we've had uh, in this sector is there was a lack of people that are Syrian in Syria who have been trained to handle these sorts of issues before. So hmm. because almost everyone, I'd like to stress this. The training almost, would be some way that Congress could, in terms of, 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 of resources and such in this arena? Well, we're very thankful for the resources that Congress has given and continues to give us to allow these programs to happen. It's not necessarily something that money can solve. Right. It's a time issue, and it's about just not having enough people trained in Syria that have those, those, those skills. Over time, we've been able to build a base for that, but I'm happy to ask my team and see if there's any actual asks that they have that Please you do. can help. Please do. Please do. We're most interested. Ambassador Thanks. Jeffrey, the United States cannot be implicit in supporting the murderous Assad regime. How do we approach supporting civil society and the many people in the opposition across the country if we restrict our stabilization funding? Um. Once again, we believe in stabilization programs uh, where we have our own forces on the ground, uh, just as we believe in humanitarian assistance, which we have not just for people outside of uh, uh, Syria, but also I think in 14 provinces, uh, we have various uh, partners that deliver aid. So various kinds of aid are underway. The specific issue of stabilization uh, funding, uh, the president took the decision, and I support that decision, of course, uh, to try to get other countries to provide funding uh, to reinforce what we're doing on the ground in the fight against ISIS, where we bear 99% of the mm -hmm. on-the-ground Syrian uh, combat role. Uh, our advisory role. And uh, we've been fairly successful so far. We've uh, collected about 300 million in, in the last nine months. Uh, that money is now being uh, uh, deployed by teams uh, that Good. Mr. Jenkins and I are, are working with. And uh, we'll be trying to find further funding from the international community, which has as much of an interest in peace in Syria as we do. Uh, speaking of, of, of the international community, I, I understand that the alternate peace talks uh, that Russia, Iran, and Turkey are hosting in uh, Ustana are a source of consternation to those of us who wish to see the unbrokered talks succeed. Uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, can the United States leverage its relationship with Turkey, a NATO ally, to ensure that real peace is achieved? Um, we think we can. Uh, you're referring to the Astana meeting that just uh, failed uh, early today. It failed in good part because Turkey would not uh, yield to pressure from Iran and Russia to go along with essentially Damascus's vision of how the political process should end. Uh, where we disagree with Turkey is we don't think that this particular format, the Astana format, mm -hmm. that brings these three countries in as brokers between the UN and right. the real audience of the UN in the resolution, which says, UN, you talk to the opposition, you talk to the Damascus regime, and you work out a peace settlement. This Astana process has inserted itself between the two. We went along with that, we in the international community, for a year. It has failed. Uh, it, Russia signed up at the presidential level uh, last month to form this constitutional committee by the end of December. It does not look like that's going to happen now. It's time to move on, and I agree with you. Um, I, I, it is time to move on. Thank you. I, I've run out of time. Thank and you, I Madam back. Ambassador. Good questions. Mr. Schneider of Illinois. Thank you very much, um, and thanks to both of you for, for joining us today. Uh, I've said this before here, as I look at Syria, there's three pillars of our interest there, humanitarian, security, and strategic. Uh, Mr. Jenkins, your work on the humanitarian side, 11 million people displaced, 5 million people provided medical care. Um, your words where you say, I'm going to quote you, whatever it takes to get the job done is, is 
very much appreciated uh, by us, and, and um, I hope the rest of the world has a chance to see what we're doing in that respect. Um, but I'm going to turn to um, you, Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, and um, you, you talked about Iran, and we've, we've raised the issue of Hezbollah and IRGC and, and other proxies, and you said it was an umbrella of which Hezbollah is at the top of the list. Um, how big is that umbrella? Besides Hezbollah, what other groups are of major concern? Who should we have on our radar? First of all, all outside groups who are commanded by Iran and are supporting the Assad regime are of concern to us and to most of the uh, Syrian people and to most of the neighborhood. Uh, but you have certain groups that have come in, uh, uh, Hassara groups from Afghanistan, other groups from Central Asia. You have certain Iraqi militias who have been active in the fighting. Uh, and Iran has uh, recruited some Syrians as well, but the bulk of the people are from outside. These militias are taking their orders from the IRGC, from Hezbollah. What's the command and control? Uh, ultimately, it's the Quds Force under uh, Qasem Soleimani, and I want to emphasize these people are outside of the chain of command of even the Syrian government, bad as it is. The Russians work through the Syrian government and through the regular army and normal institutions. The Iranians, uh, common to their strategy in Iraq, we've seen it in Lebanon, we've seen it in Yemen, try to create parallel institutions that are loyal to and get their orders from Tehran rather than from their own fellow countrymen and own governments. That's right. another way that they insidiously infiltrate into uh, other states. Exactly, but I think it's the insidious, insidiousness of Iran that makes it such a challenging threat. If you look over the last two years, how has Iran's position changed over the last two years? And can you cite any strategies we've implemented, any tactics that have successfully diminished their position? Uh, ending the JCPOA has uh, uh, been a dash of cold water to Iran in all of its efforts through the region in two ways. First of all, it uh, stripped from it its legitimacy as a um, uh, trusted partner in international affairs and international agreements, uh, at least from our standpoint. Secondly, and most importantly, it has robbed of Iran, particularly with the uh, beginning of the oil sanctions under the NDAA at the beginning of this month, uh, major sources of uh, finances for Iran to carry out its activities throughout the region. But even with that, my understanding is the um uh, bases that were destroyed over the summer by Israel have been rebuilt. Uh, it was reported this week that Iran continues to invest in indigenous missile manufacturing in Syria and even in Lebanon. Um, are they getting stronger? Are they getting weaker? Or are we at a status quo? Um, in my conversations with the Israelis, and I have to be very general here, uh, the Israelis are committed to doing what it takes to ensure that Iran does not threaten Israel from Syria. We support Israel in this endeavor 100 percent. We've made that clear to the Russians. Uh, the Israelis will have to speak to that themselves. When they feel they need to act, uh, I'm confident they no, will act. I, I appreciate that because Iran on Israel's border is an existential threat. But U.S. forces are north and uh, um, east of the Euphrates, hundreds of kilometers away. What leverage are we demonstrating? What effective paths have we shown that we can, we can put pressure, exert pressure on Iran to move them away from the border with Golan, to move them away from supporting these uh, proxy militias and, and getting them out of the country. Do we have any successes so far? Um, again, we talked to the Russians about uh, the necessity of achieving the withdrawal of all foreign forces from 2011 on. And uh, while that involves all forces who are now present from the outside other than the Russians who were there before, uh, we particularly stress the problem of Iran. Uh, at times, the Russians uh, seem to be interested in talking about uh, solutions that would involve the withdrawal of foreign forces. At times, they don't get concrete. Right, let, let me grab my last few seconds here, because you mentioned earlier in, in one of the uh, Q&As that um, the president talked to uh, Mr. Putin in Helsinki. Can you share with us what did they talk about, what was agreed to vis-a-vis -vis Syria specifically, and, and more specifically, what we can do to get Iran out of Syria? Uh, the president made clear, essentially, the policies that I've outlined here today. Are there any notes from that? I know this committee has asked for that information. What was said at Helsinki? What promises were made? What agreements or, or tentative agreements might have been laid out? I think I will stay with the president made clear 
uh, what our policies on Syria are. I don't think any agreements related to Syria came out of that meeting. Okay. I yield back. Thank you so much, Mr. Schneider. Excellent questions. And now I'm pleased to yield to uh, Mr. LaHood, who is no, not on our subcommittee, but has always been very interested on this issue. Thank you, Mr. LaHood. You're recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate you granting me a temporary visa to be here today. And I echo the comments of my colleagues regarding your service here in Congress. Your energy, your voice, your optimism will be missed here in Congress. So thank you for all your work. Um, Ambassador Jeffrey, um, I, I can't tell you how pleased a lot of us were that the President picked you and Secretary Pompeo picked you for the Syrian position for Syrian engagement. I think it brings a lot of credibility to the issue. So thank you for your service on this. I want to just talk a little bit or get your thoughts on Lebanon. Obviously, there are so many, so many intertwining political and security issues that relate to Lebanon. I look on the positive side in Lebanon. Uh, we just had free and fair elections in May with a new election law that would free of controversy, no protests. Uh, we had a CEDAR conference that pledged $12 billion to Lebanon, which is uh, positive. The LAF uh, continues to cooperate with American forces and American intelligence, and it's been seamless with General Aoun in charge of the Lebanese forces. Obviously, I think we have one of the best ambassadors in the world there with Ambassador Richard, and so those are the positive things. Uh, however, I look at the concerns and the challenges in Lebanon. Um, can't form a government after seven months now. Um, we have over one million refugees in Lebanon from Syria that continue to put stress and anxiety and uneasiness on the Lebanese uh, infrastructure, everything from education to transportation uh, to the government. Uh, obviously, Hezbollah continues to flex its muscle in Lebanon. It's part of the reason we have not been able to form a government there, uh, and that, that concerns me. And, uh, then also the pawn that Lebanon plays between the Sunni-Shia chess game in the Middle East. Um, but I'd be curious on, on your thoughts on the relationship, particularly on the refugees. I know we've started to see some refugees go back, but uh, hasn't been fulfilled to the level we need there. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the uh, subcommittee, Mr. Congressman. Uh, I have an agreement with Acting Assistant Secretary and good friend David Satterfield to only talk about Syria, so I have to be careful in talking about Lebanon. Now let me talk about Lebanon. Uh, and I'll do it from the standpoint of my focus in Syria, much of which is Iran. Uh, the two major problems you cited, all three, uh, Sunni-Shia conflict, Hezbollah, and refugees, uh, I see Iran flashing before my eyes when you mention all three of them. Lebanon is a victim of Iran's uh, encroachment throughout the Arab world as much as Syria is, although not to the same horrific degree. Uh, just as Lebanon previously uh, was a victim of Syria's aggression, uh, as Syria was more expansionist than it is today because it's been tied up in its civil conflict. But tomorrow it could be back doing the same sort of thing. So we have, with, and when I look at Lebanon, I see a Syria-Iran problem. That's simplifying things, but again, I have to keep it at my Syria focus level. Uh, if we can fix Syria and fix the Iranian expansionism, we are in a much better place with Lebanon. In terms of the refugees, uh, our position is clear. We do want refugees to go home, but refugee return has to be voluntary, it has to be safe, it has to be dignified, and they have to go back to areas where uh, we believe in getting information from the UNHCR and others. Uh, uh, and putting that all together are safe for them to go back to. There's very little of that in uh, Syria, particularly in the Assad-held areas. These people, in many cases, want to go back to their homes, but they do not want to live under Assad's tyranny. That's the underlying problem. Can you just, a little bit further on that, the de-escalation zones or proposed de-escalation zones, uh, what's your opinion on whether they're safe? And it seems to be that the hurdles and the hoops to go through to bring these refugees out of Lebanon back, you know, seem unattainable at this point. Um, but could maybe comment a little bit about the de-escalation zones and whether those are possible to bring people back. Um, certainly the de-escalation, there's only one de-escalation zone left, which is Idlib. Uh, but the areas where the Turks are in the northeast of the country have seen a certain return of refugees uh, to the 
tune of some tens of thousands uh, over the past six months to a year, we've seen a smaller return of refugees to the northeast where we are. Uh, and again, there has been some return of uh, refugees uh, into Assad-held areas, but of the something like uh, five and a half million refugees who've left Syria, we've only seen in the tens of thousands return to Assad. So people are voting with their feet, specifically not moving with their feet. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, for your courtesy and um, flexibility in letting me be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. LaHood. I had uh, one question, if I could, for uh, Mr. Jenkins. In my, in my opening uh, remarks, I, I uh, mentioned the, the recent diversion of uh, U.S. humanitarian assistance to uh, terrorist groups in Syria's uh, northwest area. And I'd like to give you an opportunity to explain exactly what happened and, and what was USAID's response to this incident and others we've heard about. What is the status of our humanitarian aid programs there? And I, and I totally understand this is a war zone. You're trying to deliver humanitarian aid. This is not the best situation, so I don't want you to think that we're second guessing, but there is some concern about it going to the very people we want to defeat. Well, thank you for that and thank you for your understanding, but we welcome the second guessing because it is a difficult situation and we need everyone from Congress to our State Department, other AID colleagues. Uh, you mentioned our Office of Inspector General and the reporting they did this year. You mentioned the FY16 GAO report. All of that is helpful for us because we need as much help as we can working with our partners to double down and do everything we can. And we are committed to doing this. Do everything we can to prevent fraud, waste, abuse, and diversion of U.S. taxpayer dollars. We have a zero tolerance policy. There is no acceptable amount of diversion as a cost of doing business. We don't go there. So if you look at what happened, uh, what you were referencing in your statement, it was actually, it's very illustrative. It was our third party monitors paid for, USAID's third party monitors that originally found what we thought was possible fraud. Just to clear that up, the third party monitors means that you contract with? A group that's only job is to look at our other partners and find out if they're doing their job the right way. We also have our partners themselves those, just hire. To, just yeah. to be clear, and, and those groups would be Syria-based with Syrians, Syrians controlling it, or outside folks and they control it? Is it a those are UN organization or who would, who would uh, give me a, a sense of who those third parties would be? In this case, it's a third party, con it's a contractor who has a contract. They're all Syrians inside the country. One of the challenges about Syria is all of these people are inside and we are forbidden from getting in and actually looking at it. So what we tend to do is try to triangulate and put as many different levels of different eyes on the situation as possible. So if someone misses it, someone else catches it. Our partners themselves have their own third party monitors as well. So what happened about a year ago is one of these third party monitors thought that there was a problem that HTS was diverting or getting USAID assistance. They reported it to the NGO, to us, and to the IG, Inspector General, all at the same time. By February, we found out that things actually were happening, and we immediately suspended and ended those programs. Now, in the Northwest, that is, we now have three. That was one of the three programs that we have suspended. We do not wait for the IG to come back with their findings. We immediately suspend while people investigate. What we've now put in place over the course of seven years as we've had to deal with different iterations in this difficult kinetic environment is we now have the most comprehensive, rigorous, detailed uh, mitigation mechanisms, mitigation measures, and safeguards in place than we do anywhere else in the world. And every time one of these unfortunate incidents comes to light, we use that to inform all of our other partners on how we have to up our game yet again. Those are uh, comforting words, and, and we realize how difficult it is, but we've got to give uh, the American people a sense that um, their tax dollars are being used always in the right way. And I'm glad you say it, it's not 
a little line that you write off the cost of doing business. That's not acceptable. Never. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. Mr. Deutsch. Um, <clears throat> thanks. Um, Mr. Jenkins, I'll also just finish up with you. Um, we, um, we had this, we've had this hearing and we talk about Iran and we talk about Russia and Iran's proxies and the, um, the various ways that we're trying to figure out how Iran can get pushed out. We, can, you, um, can you just take a step back for a second? You gave us some statistics, over 11 million people who have fled or have been internally displaced. Can you take a step back further and just remind us and for the members of this committee, for the American people, um, what, what, what uh, Assad has wrought on his people, um, um, the, overall, the overall toll that this has taken on the country? Well, thank you. I, you just want to see me cry again. Um, uh, no, Mr. Jenkins, you know, I'd like, I don't, I'm not saying this is what it takes, but I would like more people to be more emotional about what's happening in Syria. That's what I would like. So I'm from Pasadena, California. The Rose Bowl's a big deal there. Fill the Rose Bowl five times. Kill everybody. That's at least how many people have died. At least 500,000 people. Think about what it is to have 11.3 million people displaced, many of them many times. 5.6 5 of those made the very difficult decision to leave the country and become refugees, right? We're talking about the, all the people of New York City and all the people of Chicago displaced probably forever. I met with two amazing, courageous doctors who were married um, a few weeks ago. Some of you probably met them with the Syrian American Medical Society. Mm -hmm. The last two doctors left in Aleppo who got out barely with their lives and their 12-year-old daughter. They could have left. In fact, they come here to talk to us. But they choose to go back and are working in Idlib now, and they're afraid they don't have a way to take their daughter out if they have to get, get out. So they're, they're there taking their own blood in the middle of, because there's not enough blood for patients during surgery. So the doctors and the nurses are doing their own transfusions. That is terrible. And when we look at why do we take the risk that there might be diversions, it's because that situation is exactly where the United States government should be spending spending wisely U.S. taxpayers' dollars as an extension of our values, as an extension of our principles, and because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Mr. Jang, it's the work that, um, uh, the work that you and your colleagues do uh, is the manifestation of those values, and we're grateful for it. Thank you, and I'll just say in, in closing, as, as chairman of this uh, subcommittee for the past six years, it's broken my heart, it's broken Mr. Deutsch's heart to, uh, to see what has happened in Syria. We've seen this unfold, and, and with this hearing, the last that I will hold on, on Syria, I know that the oversight of, of our policy will be in more able hands, and uh, the pressure on you and the responsibility on you is, uh, is enormous, and I, and I I hope that you carry that weight with you and, and that heart with you and make all the right decisions for, for all the right reasons. And I encourage all of our colleagues, we, we both do, to give the attention to Syria that it deserves. Syria is, is too important and we've got to use every tool at our disposal to, to achieve an enduring defeat of ISIS, um, to get Iranian forces out of Syria and, and finally give the Syrian people, the, the peace that they deserve, the democracy that they deserve, the freedom that they deserve uh, without Assad. And may it happen. And thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Deutsch. And with that, our subcommittee is adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
screwed up. I'm okay. glad we got you. Yeah.
just questions like that, where it's like, why the Stuff like that. Stuff that can't really be too far. Um, so, but I think there's some specific like bills or budget or all these things. All right, bye everybody. Bye. All right, boss. See you later. See you later. Okay.